AMD is all over the web. Everybody's talking about their latest Ryzen 3000 CPU processors, but for once, the X570 chipset they release, which powers the CPU, has an equal amount of attention because it comes with really great feature itself and to name only one, the PCIe 4th generation. And of course, with an overpowerful processor, an over-featured chipset, Asus, wants to defend its enthusiastic title with its latest ROG Crosser 8 Hero Edition. But not everything is pink in the world of Asus, uh, because as in all of the X570 powered motherboards, there's been quite of a price jump between their predecessor and the current uh, iteration or the current uh, generation. For example, the Crosser 7 Hero was $80 cheaper than the Crosshair 8 Hero. So the question is simply, is it worth it? Is this board worth my so hard earned cash that I French sweat all year? And yes, French sweat is a thing. So together, let's find out after this. So Asus Crosser Series is an AMD only uh, premium gaming enthusiast centric motherboard. So it is normal for it to come with a little bit more of a price tag than say the Strix or uh, the Prime Pro. It comes with a better VRM, better RGB, more features IO, better troubleshooting features such as QLED, etc, etc, etc. And at the end of the day, if Asus doesn't get this motherboard right, then, you know, being its very best, what does it say for the cheaper models? So yes, stakes are high. Now, all X570 powered motherboard comes in two operating mode. If coupled with a second generation of Ryzen processors, it will operate in a PCIe third generation. But only when coupled with the Ryzen 3000 series can we unlock the PCIe fourth generation ability of the motherboard, which means quite a lot performance wise. And I'm saying this now because all through the review, I will be giving you both the different performance level of uh, the motherboard either coupled with a Ryzen 2000 or a Ryzen 3000 series. All right, so starting with the obvious, the Rock Crosser 8 Hero comes in an ATX form factor, meaning 24.4 cm wide for 30.5 cm long. We have our usual AM4 CPU socket supporting both second and third generation of Ryzen processors. VRM wise, well, this is where the Crosser Hero really, really shines. We're talking about a 14 plus two 60 amps VRM configuration. And it's not so surprising considering the fact that the Ryzen 3000 uh, gives us 12 or even 16 physical core processors. You're talking about 800 plus amps just for processors. That's more juice you'll ever need. So yeah, VRM wise, we're in the gold. We're swimming in it. Kudos to Asus for this. Heatsink wise, we have a good industry standard which does the job at keeping our phases as cool as it can be. But given the number of phases on which the actually heat wattage is spread upon, that is not very surprising. Memory wise, coupled with a Ryzen 3000, the board can handle up to 128GB of DDR4 RAM, overclockable, up to an unprecedented 4.6 gigahertz, and that is a massive jump from its previous generation. This is 1.2 gigahertz more than the Crosshair 7 Hero and actually one of the fastest clock you can find on RAM on the market. I think the only other board who can surpass it is uh, Asus' very own Maximus 11 Apex on the Intel Z390 platform, which goes up to 4.8 gigahertz. Not much of a difference here. So that really tells you what the Ryzen 3000 brings onto the game. But coupled with the second generation, this board can still support 128 gigabyte of DDR4 RAM, but overclockable only up to the 3.6 gigahertz we saw 
on its previous generation and all X470 powered motherboards. Staying in the memory, the ROG Crosshair 8 Hero supports a single M.2 solid state drive, which coupled with the Ryzen 3000 series and therefore a PCIe 4.0 enabled and with a PCIe 4th generation compatible M.2 SSD, that is a lot of acronym even for me, we can hope to see read and write speeds up to 55 or even 60 gigabit per second, about double the speed of what was available so far. And that, that's where you'll see the most definite and, and most obvious performance increase using an X570 board. But my only problem here is the cost of it because to actually see those kind of speeds, you're gonna have to upgrade your motherboard your processor and even your NVMe gum stick. Um, so is it worth it? I really leave it to you. Now, coupled with a Ryzen 2000 processor and hence uh, only operating this board in a PCIe third generation configuration, your M.2 solid state drive will still be transferring data up to the classic 32 gigabit per second. Now, to avoid any kind of thermo throttling, we have a very nice thermo padded thermo shear. I want to make a quick note about the X570 chipset. It uses twice the wattage of the X470, meaning 11 watt, and, and that is a lot of heat on a single chip, and therefore, uh, what the different manufacturers did here is to couple the chipset with an auto-adjustable fan, which, um, you know, it does a job, it keeps it cool, it doesn't make much, much noise, especially if you keep it behind your tempered glass. If you remove it, you might be able to detect it, but I wouldn't worry about it at all. Export-wise, here we have to be careful. If you're running this with a Ryzen 3000, then great, you just unlock the PCIe 4.0, which will double the available bandwidth uh, per available lanes. If you run it with a Ryzen 2000, second generation processor, then obviously you will be running your PCIe in a legacy third generation, which is half the bandwidth. Now, what does that mean? Well, for this year or possibly next six months, not much because all of the available video cards do not yet uh, max out what the PCIe third generation can bring to them. So I really leave it to you to appreciate uh, if you're gonna need it or not. All right, so back to our layout, we have four PCIe Express slots, one single slot, single speed, and three 16 slots with different speeds. Note that only the first 16 slot can deliver up to 16 PCIe lanes, meaning that if you are going for a single video card configuration, this is where you want it to be for optimal speed. In a dual GPU configuration, lanes will be shared amongst both of our PCIe slots, giving us an 8x8 bus speed. And in an improbable 3-way crossfire GPU configuration, our lanes will further be divided, giving us an 8x4x4 by by four configuration. And since these two slots are more likely to carry the heavy weight of our video cards, they obviously have been metallically reinforced. Storage-wise, we are dealing with a classic eight third generation SATA plugs able to dispense up to six gigabit per second of data each and able to run in red zero, one, five, and 10. I'm gonna have a little critic here, a personal note, which has nothing to do with Asus or the motherboard, uh, but SATA third generation, I'm starting to get sick of it because yeah, six gigabit per second per plug, was great a few years ago. I really would like to see something else, a SATA 4.0 coming in the next generation or two. IO-wise, well, let me first note the presence of an integrated IO shield, which is always a good thing, especially for first time builder. But before going there, you will note the absence of any kind of integrated display port. And that is a good thing because this will avail more phases in our VRM uh, to give to our CPU for some yummy overclocking. So I love this. And let's face it, you're buying a Crosser 8 Hero, you're not gonna use integrated graphics. You're gonna have a 1080 or 2080 or what have you. So yeah, kudos to Asus for some clear eyed maturity. All right, so starting from the left, we have a CMOS and flashback button, four USB 3.2 plugs, which can run either in five gigabit per second mode with Ryzen 2000 or in 10 gigabit mode with a Ryzen 3000 series. We also have four 3.2 first generation USB plugs, which can transfer data up to five gigabit per second. Next, we have four 3.2 second generation gen with 10 gigabit bandwidth, including a type C. That is 100 gigabit per second 
worth of data transfer just on the back IO so far. This is what? Uh, 4 plus 4 plus 12 USB plugs. Okay, 12. All right, so we also have two LAN plugs, one of which can transfer data up to 2.5 gigabit per second. The brand new X570 only so far, 802.11ax Wi-Fi 6 standard dual band adapter. Oh my God, that was an unnecessarily long sentence to pronounce. It'll give you 2.4 gigabit per second of wireless data transfer instead of the previous AC standard, which was 1.73, which Intel is still running on their Z390 motherboard. So let's see what they're gonna come with the next generation. But basically that is an incremental improvement. And what's really cool about the AX standard is that it can transfer data up to even 10 gigabit per second. Uh, uh, when uh, uh, one time comes. So with a couple of BIOS updates, I do believe that we will be able to see on the very same motherboard some uh, uh, Wi-Fi speed increase. And finally, a rather premium 8 audio channel with a S1220 Realtek codec. And I did not expect anything unless, it sounds great, Crystal clear, very nice bass. It's not as good as a Gigabyte has with the WiMAC capacitors, I'm afraid to say. But hey, something where maybe Asus might want to improve a thing or two. All right, so USB front connector wise, we have two 480 megabit second generation USB plugs, one 5 gigabit 3.2 first generation, and finally one 10 gigabit 3.2 second generation type C front panel connector, adequate, not surprising, and it just adds to the already existing 12 plugs. Enough about that. So that gives us 12 plus two, 14, 15, 16 USB plugs on a single build. So, so far we've seen the general aspect of the Crosshair 8 Eero Wi-Fi edition. And obviously that's, it has nothing to do with its predecessors. And I'm talking not only about the Crosshair 7, but the 6, the 5, the blah, 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 blah. This is something special, but to make this motherboard a crosshair motherboard and I can dance all day, it has to be coming with very specific, enthusiastically driven features, which will enable true custom water cooling support. An advanced RGB uh, lighting effect, very important. And awesome LN2 slash troubleshooting uh, uh, features. And you know what? It did not disappoint me at all. Starting with eight PWM nested fan connectors, one of which can be used with an all-in-one CPU water cooler and one which can be used for a 5 watt PWM dedicated water pump. In addition, we have a water flow connector sensor here and two thermistor connectors right here. So basically this board can support everything and any kind of cooling solution you want. Fan, all in one, and obviously single or even dual custom water cooling solutions. I love it. Well done by Asus on this one. Troubleshooting wise, we have our usual but important soldered buttons, including a start, reset, retry, and safe reboot button. With that, we have our QLED error screen, which is usually important, but became crucial here, giving us uh, multiplicity of features and the growing complexity of our board. It'll, it'll guide us into knowing why it refuses to boot on your first, second, or third. I don't know where I'm going with that. It'll, it'll help you out with your failed boots right under. And for once judicially placed, we have our easy debugger, which will Further refine our troubleshooting by telling us at what sequence of our boot, 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 our, our motherboard gets stuck. And finally, this board would not be a rug motherboard without a bunch of RGB, starting with two addressable RGB strips nested right on our motherboard, one under our IO roof, spelling the word hero, and one under our chipset heat shield. In addition, we have another four RGB connectors 
conveniently placed in pair on each extremity of our board for easy access. So if you ever wanted to put North Korea on a satellite map at night, this is the build for you. Now, in conclusion, the ROG Crosser 8 Hero Wi-Fi Edition will cost you about 360 US dollars. Again, that's $80 more than its predecessor, the Crosser 7 Hero Wi-Fi. And the old question is, is it worth it? And I'm not certain. So first thing first, if you're planning to use this board with a Ryzen 2000 series, it's absolutely not worth it for sure. It's, it's only going to give you the, what the X470 chipset used to give you. It's not gonna give you anything, maybe a bit better of VRM, but it's not worth it at all. Nothing that the Crosser 7 Hero cannot do, and I would stay away from it at all cost. Again, if you're staying with a Ryzen 2000 processor. But if you are going with a Ryzen 3000 series, which will unlock all the bandwidth ability of the PCIe 4th generation, then I still wouldn't go for the Crosser 8 Hero. And that's because Asus also released in the same time the excellent ROG Strix X570E that I re reviewed just a week ago and that you should absolutely go and take a look at, which costs $30 less and will do absolutely everything that the Crosser 8 Hero can. There's probably like one or two phase differences, but nothing which will impede your overclocking power. It will look exactly the same. There, there is the same amount of RGB connector if it's so important for you. It does uh, the exact same job in supporting custom water cooling. It, what can I say? Uh, sure, there's maybe 200 megahertz on the RAM, which will differ, but nothing that you will notice on your performance day to day. And I think that Asus seriously cannibalized itself by releasing two very similar boards. For the first time, the Strix has a QLED screen. So it doesn't, it, it really takes away the motivation to, to increase to a more enthusiastically friendly motherboard and more expensive one like the Crosshair series. And actually, the way I would have done this is release the Prime X570 Pro, the Tough, the Strix, and jump directly to the formula because there is no room for the Crosser 8 Hero in that series. The Strix is simply too good and cheaper for the Crosser 8 Hero to even exist. So yeah, that's where your money should go on the Strix X570e.